Sean Cassidy, our first speaker this morning. And when I asked him yesterday, Sean, what would you like for me to share with the audience about you? He said, ah, oh, just tell them I'm an artist. <laughs> if you know Sean, you know he's much more than an artist. Uh, he's British born, hence my attempt at an accent. And he's been creating work in the United States since 1991. He studied sculpture in London and Canada, and his work has been seen in exhibitions across this country and in France. His work has also been featured in publications such as Sculpture Magazine, Art in America, and the Wall Street Journal. Sean has been an artist in residence at over 10 residency venues across the US, including our very own McCall Center for Art and Innovation. He is a professor of art at Winthrop University, and he's currently working on public art installations for the Charlotte Area Transit System and ASC's public art program. Please welcome to the stage, Sean Cassidy. Uh, good, good morning. Um, thrilled to be here. Slightly nervous. Um, it's, it's really going to go downhill from now because I've never made anything as beautiful as these, these two kids up here on this, this uh, projector. I, I want to talk about three things that relate to my creative process and have had an enormously positive effect on my creative development. And they are disruption, difficulties and differences. And I think there's a, generally there would be a kind of negative connotation associated with those three ideas. But I, I want to tell three stories that have happened to me that I think flip the coin and present a different, a different um, possibility. In 1998, I applied for a residency at a place called the Jurassic Residence Artist Program in, in Woodside, California. It was a very, very competitive residency fellowship. And you know, I, I was a, um, tip, I think I'm a fairly typical, egotistical, ambitious artist. And I, I had applied in the hope that getting this fellowship would launch my artistic career and I, I would be on the front cover of Art Forum and I would be a superstar. So I, I went to, I was lucky enough to, to, to uh, be accepted to the program and, and I um, went there with lots of expectations. And the residency director picked me up from the San Francisco airport, drove me out to the residency program. And he opened the studio doors. And I um, had a kind of mini nervous breakdown. My heart dropped. My jaw dropped. And I, you know, I was presented with a studio space that was just polished concrete floors and white walls. There was absolutely nothing in the studio with which to make sculpture. And I, I'm, I'm, a, oh, excuse me, I'm an artist that's used to lots of materials, lots of tools, lots of equipment with which I can make sculpture. So here I am presented with this situation where there's nothing, absolutely nothing. So the, the, uh, the, the residency director was excited to show me this studio because he thought it was absolutely wonderful. And he said, what do you think? And I totally kind of BS'd him and said, oh, this is wonderful. It's a marvelous studio. But internally, I was thinking, what on earth am I going to be able to do here for six weeks? Because there's nothing with which I can make sculpture. So I spent the first week of that residency program in a kind of state of chaos, because I had no idea how I was going to overcome this massive disruption to my creative process. You can see from the image up on the screen, it was, a, it was a beautiful location, um, it, right in, in Woodside, ocean was in the distance, and it was founded by a brilliant scientist named Dr. Carl Gerassi. He invented the birth control pill, so he's loaded with money, and he's also a brilliant playwright, and he's had numerous plays performed on Broadway, so he's, he's a, a thoroughly obnoxious human being because he's brilliant on both sides of his brain. Um, and he founded this institution. Um, in memory of his daughter who committed suicide. She was a poet and she committed suicide as a, as a young poet and he, he uh, built this facility that brings together writers, poets, artists, musicians over the summer, puts them in this giant five-sided barn to see what happens when they're all together. So I spent the first week of this program just walking through the beautiful landscape that surrounded the program. With didn't even take a sketchbook and I, I noticed several things as I was walking. And normally I would think of walking in terms of my creative process as a total waste of time. 
Um, and so I, I noticed that spring there had been enormous amount of rainfall in California. Huge sides of, of hills were sliding off huge amounts of land erosion. So I was thinking about erosion and decay. And I was also thinking about my family. I have three sisters. I have a twin sister who lives in London, middle sister who lives in Australia, and a young sister who lives in New Zealand. So we're a very dispersed family, and that's a great source of sadness, personally, for me, because we never get together now, because the cost is just too prohibitive. So after a week of walking and thinking about, primarily about these two things, the sadness of my loss of family and the, the erosion and the decay, I came back to the residency program, borrowed the maintenance guy's truck, drove to Home Depot, bought a truckload of wood, thin strips of wood, a, a really co a cheap cordless drill and a really cheap Chinese chop saw. And I, I set about to build a 20-foot square ghost of a dining room. And I wanted to put it in the landscape because I wanted the landscape to be visible through the structure. And I chose the image of a dining room because for me, the dining room is a metaphor for this idea of, of the family dissolving. For, for me, as a, as, a, as a young kid growing up in London, the dining room was always the place where the family would come together on a Sunday afternoon and have a roast dinner, roast lamb, mashed potatoes, peas, and what the whole thing. So for me, it was the, it's the symbol of family togetherness. So by making an eroded version, I was kind of commenting on the dissolving of the family unit. Now, the reason I put this image up and I start my talk with this story is this is radically different than any sculpture I had made prior to this point, right? If I had walked into that studio and I had found equipment and tools and a pile of steel and a pile of clay, I would have continued on habits that I had formed over the previous 10 years. But that huge disruption forced me to stop, to think, to reevaluate, and to emerge with something that was radically new. And it opened up a whole new creative direction in my work. So I, I, I go from the negative disruption to something that turned out to be immensely positive in my creative development. The second story I want to tell you is, is about the value of parameters and the value of, of difficulties. Again, we think of difficulties as, as being something negative, but I found in my own life it's, it's often quite the opposite. You all know that recently they built the light rail from 7th Street all the way down to Pineville, and they invited 13 artists to build work for that system. I was lucky enough to be one of the, the folks chosen, and I was very excited. I'd been hemorrhaging money up to this point, going from paycheck to paycheck. I was, I was interested in trying to save a little bit of money for Lucy's um, college fund. And they called me into the office and I said, great, Sean, here's the, here's the deal. Here's the budget. Here's the timeline. Here are the stations we want you to build sculptures for. I'm happy as a clam. I can, you know, hear cha-ching. I can hear the money going in the bank. Um, everything's going great. But at the end of the meeting, an engineer stood up and he said, but you can't have any space. Right? Now, they've just been talking to me for a couple of hours about building 20 sculptures for the light rail system. And now the engineer is telling me, you can't have any space. So there was no way I was going to blow that commission in front of all those administrators and admit that I had no idea how you could possibly do that. So I, I left the room. I said, yes, no problem. I'll, I'll figure that out. I left the room, and I called my, I called my wife. I said, these people are nuts. How can you possibly build 20 sculptures without taking up physical space? So again, I was completely anxious, upset, confused. I had no idea how I was going to resolve this seemingly impossible parameter or difficulty. Um, following on from my lovely experience in California, I now tend to walk a lot to generate ideas, and I no longer think of it as a waste of time. Um, so I, I picked up this beautiful eroded leaf in Lansford State Canal Park in Chester. If you've never been there, it's one of the most beautiful places on the planet. In May, there's a, a, a cream white colored spider lily that it's the only place in the world where this grows. It's absolutely spectacular. Anyway, back to the leaf. I found this eroded leaf, took it home, put it on my desk. No idea really what was gonna happen with it. I just thought it was beautiful. 
And I kept looking at it, and then I started to think, gosh, there's an enormous visual similarity between that eroded leaf and a map. Right? The spine of the, the, spine of the, the, the leaf looks like the train tracks of where I need to put sculptures. And this eroded skeletal section looks like a map. And I thought to myself, well, maybe there's a little tiny idea in there that if I nurture it and noodle it enough, I might be able to get a good idea from it. So what I did was this. The obnoxious engineer, he wasn't really that obnoxious, but I call him the obnoxious engineer because it makes the story more fun. Um, he had given me a roll of drawings of things that you have to have on a train station to receive federal funding. You've got to have garbage cans, you've got to have lights every 100 feet, and you've got to have a fence that runs between the train tracks to stop people hopping from one side to the other. So I thought, right, I'm going to cut a hole in this guy's fence, and I'm going to weld these giant leaves into his fence, and I won't be taking up any space of his. So this, was, this is what I did. I, I proposed to cut holes in the fence and insert different leaves at each train station. And what, what happens is everything that is above the top of the, of top of the fence becomes bright green because they were terrified of color. So I wanted to introduce some bright green, <laughs> kind of wake everybody up and um, inject some idea of growth actually into the, into the artwork. And everything that falls below the top of the fence is a skeletal, it makes reference to the eroded skeletal leaf, but is in fact a map of the area around the train station. So if you see the dot that's in the center of the, the, the bottom section, that represents where you are in relationship to the map of the community around where you, where you live. So it's kind of a game. You stand on the platform, where am I going, where do I live, where does my grandma live? Um, I, I went back to Katz, I pitched the idea, I took the model. Within 20 minutes, they doubled the budget, and I went from 20 sculptures to 40 sculptures. I love that engineer. <laughs> As a result of that project, I've gone on to do five projects with cats, so I love him even more. And the, to me, what's important about this story is I never would have come up with that idea if I hadn't been put within such rigid parameters, right? That box, I thought, was so tight, there's no way I can do anything creative within those parameters. But pushing up against those parameters allowed me to make this work. Okay, last story. Uh, four years ago, I was lucky enough to go on sabbatical from my university. They said, go away, be creative, come back, a better teacher. Marvelous. So I thought to myself, what do I want to do? Uh, I thought, right, well, California in 1998 was tremendously valuable to me because it was so disruptive and it opened up a whole new creative direction for me. So I want to do something that's a similarly kind of disruptive. So I thought, Right, I'm going to go to India, and I'm going to go to a residency program. So I, I found a, a residency program in New Delhi and called the Sanskriti Kendra. And I, I deliberately didn't do any research. I didn't really want to know about India. I didn't want to know about the residency program because I just wanted to go there cold turkey and just be completely thrown off track and then forced to react to the difficulty of the situation. So I got to India. You know, completely thrown off track, jet lag, culture shock, the whole thing. Very, very strange studio situation. And the, the second day I was there, another artist arrived in the studio next to me, and her name was Christy Varenga. She's an American artist who was living in Ireland, and she wasn't kind of, I, I was expecting to be thrown off track. She wasn't expecting to be thrown off track, and she was in really bad shape. She was really upset and really miserable and talking about going home, having only been there for a day. And I said, well, Christy, hold on a second. Let's, let's share a taxi into town. Let's drive around and just get a sense of what New Delhi's like. So we, with no, no particular artistic intention in mind, we spent the day driving around. And we ended up in the fabric market. And I got into the fabric market and my intuition and my gut just went crazy. As an artist, I've learned to trust my intuition implicitly. When my gut says do something, I tend to do it. My gut was, was screaming, buy the fabric, <laughs> buy the fabric. So 
The Indian guy who was running the market was very, very clever. He recognized within an instant that I was like a six-year-old in a candy store. And the longer he kept me in that market, the more money I was going to spend. So he brought me out cups of tea, two ham sandwiches, and then a, and a Pepsi. And I, I spent about an hour and a half in there. And his strategy was outstanding because I spent hundreds of dollars on fabric that I was just responding to intuitively. No idea of what it was going to become, what it could become. So at this point, Christy was pretty sick of me because I was you know, ranting and raving about the beauty of this pink fabric and the beauty of this gold fabric. And she just wanted to get back to the studio and make her work. So we drove back. She ran away to her studio and started making her oil paintings. I, on the other hand, dumped all the fabric out on the grass ran to my studio, got a pair of scissors, and started chopping it up, laying it on the floor, hanging it on the side of buildings, floating it on lily ponds. I was just playing with the material to see if I could find any creative possibility or capacity in this material. The director of this program was looking out of the window in his second floor office, and he thought I was having some kind of mental nervous <laughs> breakdown because the way I was moving was so strange. But really, I was just trying to investigate the properties of this material. This is kind of embarrassing, but I'm going to say, say it anyway. There was a certain point in the afternoon where I put a piece of fabric under a tree, and I nearly wet my pants because I was so excited about what had happened. It doesn't look that exciting to you, probably, but to me, it was immensely exciting because I could now see a creative possibility for this fabric. So I ran over to Christie's studio, banged on the door, I said, Christy, you've got to come look at this. Come look at this thing. Because I wanted to share my excitement with somebody. I, had no, I couldn't call my wife because of the time difference. I had no one to share this uh, enthusiasm with. And she was, Christy said, go away, Sean. Leave me alone. I, I want to just keep making my painting. But I kept, kept hounding her, banging on the door. Come on, Christy, you've got to come see this. So eventually, she was nice enough, wonderful woman, nice enough to come out. And we spent an hour standing in front of this piece of fabric on the ground with the shadow. It was one of the most memorable, important conversations I've ever had in my life. There was so much creativity and synergy between the two of us. We went from, it could be this, we could do this. Have you thought about that? What about this? What about that? And all of a sudden, we were escalating each other and empowering each other to step beyond what we thought was possible. At the end of that one hour conversation, we decided, because of the richness of it, we decided, you know what, we're going to collaborate for the next five weeks. We're going to work together as a team on everything we do for the next five weeks. And what we ended up doing was cutting a, we did five projects together, but this is one of the projects that I want to talk about. We, we cut these giant discs of fabric, and we would rent a taxi for the day, and we would drive around New Delhi, and we would put the disc down on the ground. And we would just photograph the events that would unfold because of the placement of that disc. For us, it was like composing a painting with moving elements and something that acts as the kind of catalyst for change. So here we are in the Chadney Chook market. We put down this beautiful turquoise disc that falls into the furrows of the rickshaw and begins to make connections to the arch, the, the arch of the temple, the Hewitt Packet advertising, and the, the sari, the lady sari on the, on the back left. Here's another photograph in the flower market. Um, we put down this beautiful disc, and then people started to congregate around. It begins to make re relationships, formal relationships, to the round bundles of flowers. It was an amazing experience. We had people put offerings on the discs. We had people lay down on the discs. We had people throw us out of sights because they didn't like the color we'd chosen for their venue. It, it was an amazing experience. And we both recognized that it would never have happened if our two different creative capacities had not come together to allow something new to emerge. We would have, we would have thought, uh, you know, in the creative process, there's a voice of doubt that sits on your shoulder that says, oh, don't do that. That's a terrible idea. But working with a collaborative partner, I think, often quietens that voice of doubt and actually empowers you to be more courageous. We both recognized that we empowered each other to go way beyond our comfort zone, the edge of our comfort zone, and make something that we never would have done alone. Um, so I, I would like to finish with this thought. I mean, I would like to challenge us all to think about how can we, how can we flip it? 
when we're confronted with disruption, when we're confronted with difficulties, when we're confronted with differences, how do we flip it and how do we allow just momentarily to pause and think, is this an opportunity to use this perceived difficulty as a catalyst that might allow something new and very original and exciting to emerge in its place? Thank you.